Thanks. Take her down to periscope depth. Yes, sir. Clear the bridge. Dive. <laughs> I'm Salvador Cordova. Welcome to Evidence and Reasons, a channel dedicated to exploring evidence and reasons for the Christian faith. So today it's just going to be a very detailed talk. Uh, for, for those who always who, who may wonder why I focus so much on biology and the creation evolution controversy, it is the best evidence of God's work. One of the best evidences that, that I know of that can be independently confirmed that life is a miracle and if life is a miracle there needs to be a miracle maker so this is how it relates to the christian faith it is evidence of a creator life is evidence of a creator that <clears throat> can work miracles that has powers of knowledge far beyond all the sum total of um, human capability and perhaps only now in the 21st century do we realize the genius that Put it together and we're finding out we've been basically told falsehoods by the evolutionary community that life is clumsy and and that it's poorly designed that is not true it is intelligently designed superbly designed but also intelligently cursed we know that the genomes are deteriorating and and so that's basically why we're exploring this topic today i'm privileged to have emory moina and he, like our graduate students of biology, and we're just going to try to get to know each other a little better. We'll talk about eukaryotic evolution and a little bit about protein evolution. So, Emery, just uh, go ahead and introduce yourself again. I totally lost the last recording I had of you. So, you could just briefly introduce yourself. Sure. And uh, I'll talk about biology. Sure. Um, so, uh, my name is Emery Moyna. That is not my real name. You can read the, my website uh, in his image blog to figure out why um, I'm not using my real name. Basically, it's because I'm a graduate student in biology. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, but anyway, so uh, I, I have a blog where I put out uh, articles three times a week in his image blog. Also, have a YouTube channel where videos go up um, generally once a week. 
Um, yeah, so my, my preferences in biology are very much uh, baromenology, speciation, genetics, uh, but basically anything that it doesn't involve me digging into protein structures or human anatomy and physiology. Um, and I will, uh, I'll probably be interested. So yeah, that, that's, that's me in a nutshell. Uh, do you have any interest in cellular biology? Uh, honestly, um, I, I, I do, but at the same time, it's very much on a cursory level because when I took my undergraduate in biology, which I think I, I forgot to mention, I'm working on a grad grad degree in biology right now. Um, I ducked the cell biology class. It wasn't required. So I ducked it because it was, they said it was very hard and I was working full time and taking classes. So I'm like, I, I think I'll just not submarine my GPA and I'll take something else. <laughs> Okay, well, you know, that tells me just how I've been continually amazed how how broad the spectrum is in biology degrees, all the specialties. Mm -hmm. And just like in other disciplines now, there's so many classes and it's like there's no reasonable way you could expect the student to take every class mm -hmm. in the curric that's available in the curriculum. So uh, yeah. a lot of things have become elective now because um, at least even like in the engineering uh, disciplines where I was, I'm just like, oh my goodness, there's so many classes and they're all good, but mm -hmm. uh, there's no way you can, it's like, this would be a five, six year degree just, just to get through an undergrad. So that's just kind of what, where it's going. All right. So that I'm, you know what, I'm really, really glad I asked you those questions because those are exactly what I'm focusing on, which is protein structures and cellular <laughs> biology. Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, since you hadn't taken cellular biology, would you be interested in at least talking about it? Sure, uh, sure. I'm always interested in learning stuff. It's just I don't have the background that you do. So, uh, it, well, <laughs> so you had uh, you had genetics, which is even in genetics, there are all these specialties, as I found out. Uh, there's theoretical population genetics, which I have some background in. But then like this, uh, the last week where they were talking about time to most recent common ancestry, I didn't want to touch that with a 10 foot pole. <clears throat> and then I began to look at it a little more carefully and I realized, yeah, it's <laughs> that was a good idea, Sal, because uh, even among evolutionary biologists, they, they have some problems deciding what's the best model. And to have the best model, they need to know the size of the population and structure, which means all the subpopulations at any given time. If you want to, have, I'm just like, well, that's sort of circular. Uh, you know, um, you assume the size of a population and that, that would actually answer certain questions about Adam and Eve, like, the creationist model would be just two people at one point. Right. And then they have the 10,000 people. I'm just like, okay, this is going to be a total mess. And I just, I just said, I'm not going to touch it. I, I looked recently at a paper that did analysis of eight different time to most recent common ancest ancestor models. And I'm like, yeah, they, they don't all agree. And they assume like 10,000 years. I said, no one's, uh, how are, how are the creationists going to argue this without also saying, well, we need to make it two people at the beginning. So there's just, uh, it's just fraught with too many disagreements mm -hmm. where people will have an easy, uh, an easy time of disputing the creationist conclusions because there's some elements of their model that, uh, can't independently be proven. So I said, I'm not going to touch that. So you said genetics. I'm just like, yeah, there's various parts of genetics. And then there's kind of like the sequencing genetics, which is uh, because the sequencing machines are not, right. they, they have a hard time doing long reads and the assembly of all those little pieces. So they take a 3 billion piece genome, just chop it up into 300 bases at most. And then they reassemble it like a jigsaw puzzle and that that's also fraught with problems. So, yep. 
so that's so you said genetics and yes. speciation and baromenology. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I think I'm going to have to learn that from you. That those are also areas. Baromenology is not anything that I'm. I, I happen to know the co-founder of baromenology, which is Walter Remine, and mm. the other founder is Kurt Wise. He's more well known, but a lot of the quote unquote old timers really knew Walter Remine was. Yeah. yeah. I'm uh, currently working through my way through Remine's book, The Biotic Message. Oh, wow. God bless you. Um, it hurts my head, believe me. <laughs> it hurt mine too. <laughs> so you'll actually get to see uh, toward the end, you, you, there's a chapter called Discontinuity Systematics. And uh, at the cellular level, the discontinuities are just blatant. Uh, b between the three major domains, archaea, mm -hmm. area, and uh, bacteria. Oh my goodness. So now, have you done any stuff with BLAST for uh, your genetics work? Do you Am do, I what? I didn't, I'm do, sorry, I didn't catch that. Do, do you do anything with gene browsing? Uh, with genetics work, I don't. I know have do done it. some some stuff with gene browsing, some stuff with like alignment software and so on. Um, I'm not great, but I'm good enough. <laughs> so when you do work with genetics, what does that um, or you have interest in that field? What what specifically does um, geneticists? I mean, so, I know that sounds like a really dumb question, but it's like I, I, I know it's different things to different people. Right. Um, so I enjoy, like, I enjoy comparative genetics. I do a little bit, I dabble in, in, uh, gen in the genetic aspects of phylogenetics. Um, let's see here. I, I like to, um, just basically it's comparative genetics and phylogenetics is what I, what I get into. I don't, I don't have the, uh, the s skills yet or the, um, equipment to do any sequencing or anything like that. Now, how did you do, um, what, speci what specifically, um, so I presume you built some phylogenetic trees? Yes, I did. Okay, tell me how you did that. Um, so I use Mega for that. Um, okay, so let me show that, let me bring that up on the screen. And okay. we can, this is great, because this is what I, this is where I was hoping our conversation would go. We'll start with Mega. And I'm, I'm bringing it up right now. So I interrupted you. Please go on. Oh, no, that's fine. Um, I use Mega, and I played around with various ones. Um, I, did a, I did a very interesting uh, combination of phylogenetics and uh, biogeography, where I, I basically took the mitochondrial DNA sequences of all the living cats that have their sequences done, um, and then I um, went through and aligned them all and ran them through the phylogenetic software. And uh, once I was done doing that, I basically then mapped out, okay, where do these guys live today? And I sort of built a phylogenetic tree of sorts um, and figured out, okay, what well, what does this look like, um, you know, across the, how, how did they diversify after the flood, essentially, was what I was working on. So that was, that was kind of a nice little cross-section. Well, this is this is excellent because uh, we can kind of compare notes of how to do basically how to do business mm -hmm. and how we go about doing what we try to do. Right. And I, I was hoping we would be able to share with the audience. You see, I, I'll tell you something. I, I don't know if you saw that show that I had with Erica, who's not a creationist. She's yeah, definitely on the other side. I, I am trying to get caught up on everything that came out over the last like week and a half. So, but I'm it's all it's in the yeah, I'm planning to watch it. I just haven't got to it yet. <laughs> well, no, no, it's not that. Um, it, I'm not offended if you didn't watch it, uh, because we're going to cover just a tad the most important parts here as we talk about mega. But the point is, my opponents treated me very different after that. It's like, oh yeah, oh my goodness. Uh, Sal actually knows something about phylogenetics. Mm -hmm. And they can't be, I mean, after that, anyone who actually watched it, uh, they can't say, no, he doesn't understand what he's talking about. Because I was sharing in that some things that maybe the audience didn't themselves even know. And I said, that's, that's good. 
I mean, if I'm in a situation where I'm teaching another, uh, teaching someone from an evolutionary background, a little something, I mean, I'm not, my knowledge depth is very shallow, but still, even then, relative to most people on the internet, it's like, yeah, I have probably more than most. So they can't accuse me. And, and that moved the conversation forward a little bit, just because it's like, okay, uh, now you know where my arguments are really coming from. So it always um, helps if your opponents realize that you actually do know what you're talking about. Yes. Yes. In that mood that you see there at that point, I said, let's, let's just have a, a meeting. They came out Friday. I, I was very, very flattered. Erica Dapper Dino and David Neff showed up and they said they, you know, um, they did want to talk about these things. And I said, now we're, you know, we're, we're this isn't going to be a flame throwing insult war. We're just going to talk. We have the same set of tools, more or less, and we'll just talk. We'll talk science and probability, and you know, no need to make it um, some sort of ideological war. We're just going to talk facts mm -hmm. and uh, theory. That's that's it. So let me show for the audience, Mega. This is the screen, and I'm going to highlight it. So that so you had something like this, mega. Yes. This is molecular evolutionary genetic analysis. So you had all these cats. Now, how could you use mega for the cat? Was that a whole genome or just isolated? Uh, I was using mitochondrial DNA sequences. Um, how would I do that? How would I grab? Actually, see, this is educational. How would you grab a mitochondrial DNA sequence? Okay, so what you would need to do to get those mitochondrial DNA sequences, I pulled up my mega too, so I remember how to do this. <laughs> um, so you'd need to go into the alignment section, and you would want to you click show web browser. Oh, I see. You learned, you taught me a new, so align, and there's, I didn't even know there was a web browser section. Okay. Yeah. See, now we're, we're, we are yeah. learning, this is a skill I didn't have. Yeah, and so what you would then do is you would type in Felidae, which is the um, cat family. Um, oh, you know what? You know what? I think I'm going to hand it off to you. Do you have okay. your mega software? I'm sorry, what? Do you have your mega software running right now? I do. I do. It is running right now, yes. I'm going to shut mine down. Would you like to show your screen? Uh, you... Sure. I've got like 50,000 tabs open, but sure. <laughs> Let me close I, I tell tabs. You what, how about I wait till you... If you need to close me, okay, I think, okay, I've got it. Let me maximize so it's full screen so that everybody doesn't have to see all the other 50,000 things I'm working on. Uh, there we there go. Okay, a, so. There may be a way to share your application if it doesn't me, have all Yeah, let me, let me see if I can figure that out real quick. So we're like, share, I think. We're oh, application window. Yes, it'll allow me to share application windows. Yes, okay. Uh, no, don't <laughs> all right, so Mega try. should be sharing. Okay, I wouldn't entirely trust it, but uh, uh, let me just take a peek, make sure it's okay. I'm getting a black screen. Is that correct? Uh, should not be. Why would that? How about now? That's not it. So, um, where it? Where did my mega go? Can you can you see it now? Uh, let's try it. Let me do a highlight. No, it's just a dark screen. All right. Well. I'm uh, okay, sorry I'll about that. You, I tell you what, that's one of the problems with the application share. It, it doesn't always work. You may have to share your. Um, yeah, let, let me try doing. Let me see if I can share my application screen. OK, let me let me try that. So application window. Yeah, it's just. <laughs> I get the black screen of death. Too. Okay, so I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to share my full screen is what you're telling me. Okay, let me switch that into let me get mega up. All right, I need to share my entire screen. Yes. And then I need to bring mega up. All right, so you should be seeing. Are you seeing mega at this point? Yes, and then I'm gonna highlight. Now you should be able to see. Do you see it also? Oh, you may not be able to see. I, have I can't. I can't see anything that's on screen, Sal. So if something goes wrong, you have to tell me about it. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. 
that's just FYI. That's one of the benefits of having uh, four monitors. Uh, I actually have a second monitor. I just don't have a place to put it. <laughs> so Roger that. Uh, but okay, I, so I do want to. National Library of Medicine. Yeah. So we're in the national. So this is what the, this is what it'll bring up when you open the web browser, and you can you just type in Fever Day, and then you go down here, and you've got a bunch of different options. Um, but what you want is nucleotide in the okay. genome section. You want nucleotide. And that will give you a list of a bunch of different... Now, this like this is Anisionix jubatus. I'm pretty sure that's the cheetah, if I remember correctly. Okay. Um, this is a full genome sequence. Like This is like a whole genome shotgun sequence. If you tried messing with this in Mega, you would unless you're running with like the world's fastest computer, you will probably crash your computer and get nowhere. Okay. Um, because it just, it's so big. So what you want is instead of doing this, you want to go to mitochondria and they see this little button there that where my mouse is. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but there's where I've just checked that says mitochondrion. Now, did you do this for any of your, any of your classes? Um, I have not been required to do it yet. I expect I will. I actually did submit a, um, one of these five logenies as part of a discussion. It wasn't required, but I submitted it anyway. Cause I was, cause it was cool. Um, but yeah, so anyway, so what you've now done is you've brought up mitochondrial DNA sequences. Now, now how you want to do this, you want to do a couple of things. First of all, there's 700 pages of this. So what you want to do is scroll to the bottom of the page. Instead of 20 per page, do 200 per page. It will save you a lot of time. Um, and then what you want to, you want to sort not by default order, but by length. And what this will do if it actually sorts, come on, come on. Ah, there we go. So what we now have is this is now the complete, I now have the complete mitochondrial genome sequence for, and this is for Puma con color. Um, and then there's a bunch of other ones you could get. If you scroll down some more, you'll have other ones like there's Panthera Leo, which is the lion. Um, let's go down a little bit more. Here's find another one. Panthera tigris altica. That's the alpine. That's like the uh, mountain tiger, I presume. That's a subspecies of tiger. Um, so you, and if you wanted to add these sequences, you would click, you'd have to open it. So you have to click on it. It'll open up. And then you need to click add to alignment at the top of the screen. Now it gives you a bunch of options. You want to import the full sequence. Now the, the reason it does this, this CDs thing, that's a, that's, really technical and really nerdy but cds cds is uh i should know the name is that like complementary double strand or something I, um I, I think that's basically what we're talking about um it basically it's asking you do you want the full sequence or do you just want certain sections of it um and we want the full sequence for this so uh, you import the full sequence and then it allows you to name it so i just say puma con color and then i put um the accession number which where is that gotcha uh, that way i know like that way when if if and when and they always do the atheists come after me um not necessarily some of the youtube people but some of the more toxic ones come after you you have some backup and you can say hey you know i just use publicly accessible data and they really can't argue with the data because it wasn't done by creationists so that that's the accession number yep. there the jn nine 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 etc and you can add some other names as well. This is um, why, even though this, you know, you see, our channel is, is is not for just entertainment. We are laying it down right here, and and you know, if they want to accuse us, it's like, yeah, you, you're gonna have to. We're showing we're fighting for every inch here. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, this is why I'm making this public. You people will see our materials and methods. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Materials and methods. <laughs> um, so you want to you click OK here, and that adds that pops up a new window. Window, and what you've got now, can you see the new window? That imported it just like that. Yeah, see, right into an alignment sequence, and this is seventeen thousand base bases. Some odd. So now you now you can't align with just one thing. So what you need to do is you need to go find yourself something else that to align it against. And I'm just going to pick a random uh, lion from Ethiopia. Um, we will get to, we will get to the house cat. Um, the house cat's MT DNA genome is a little bit shorter though, and the reason I think the reason it's a little bit shorter is probably just due to like transmission error because their generation times are shorter. 
Um, that would be my guess. I don't have empirical data to confirm that, but that's my that's if I'm guessing, that's the reason why. Because it's just they've had more pieces fall off over the years due to just like genetic degradation. This this what we're doing today is exactly what I was hoping our dis where our discussion would lead. Because <laughs> All right, awesome. It, now, be very, but by the way, since I know you have these skills, you'll be surprised how easy the argument is against protein universal common ancestry. Pretty easy. <laughs> All right. Well, so then then what we've got is I've just added the lion to the sequence. Now I know because I've already run this data once that the lion and the puma do not share the same subgroup within the family Felidae. They're in two different subgroups. Um, but if you look at the, if you just look at the data though, right off the t off the top, it color codes for you real nice, and you can see. But there there are some differences. There are a few differences just right off the top. I mean, here's the first one right here. You have a C here instead of a T. Um, yeah, running the line. A and a G right there. So you got a couple of them right there. So now we need to we need to do more than two. I could sit here and like there's like I think there's like thirty. Oh, goodness, it's been a couple of months since I've done this. It's, it's, it's there's 20 or 30 different cats, essentially. Um, and here, here's Panthera pardus. This is the leopard. Um, so we'll add the leopard to this as well. Um, and you, you, right now, I'm not really being choosy. I'm just grabbing stuff so that it's understood for sake of time. You sh probably should be more choosy than I am being right now. Now, sometimes you won't. Okay. Sometimes yeah. you won't have the option because there's only one for a particular species. Yeah. But if you have an option, you probably should be just a little bit choosier than I'm being at the moment. Well, one of the challenges is that uh, the database may be overrepresented with one particular species. Well, People correct. sequencing and dumping it in the gen bank. So, That's also true. Yeah. I mean, just look at the number of Panthera Leo sequences there are. Yeah. And why do you think that is? For a couple of reasons. One, people would much rather work with lions because, you know, they're cool than some, than, than Prionolurus, which is a little bit further down here. Um, they, it's just a natural human tendency. Um, lions, tigers, leopards, they tend to be over, the, the big animals that we think of as, you know, alpha predators are really cool. Those tend to get overrepresented in these kind of databases um, because people want to work with them. Um, and it's just, you know, it's, it's just a natural human tendency, uh, which is why it's oftentimes hard to find smaller animals that are not native to the United States um, in these gen bank sequences because people just don't want to work with them. Mm -hmm. um, and fi fish is another one. It's really tough to find fish in here. If you if you get, particularly saltwater fish, um, if you're trying to, do, like I tried to do a phylogeny with saltwater fish, and I just, I, I spent, I spent something like half an hour looking for just a family that had more than two or three species represented. It was it was nuts. It was like this is impossible. How do you even? Um, because generally, generally speaking, when they build phylogenies, they build them with like small sections of DNA. Um, unfortunately, I wish they would use more larger sections of the DNA, but there are limits with the, both the technology and with the DNA sequences that are available. So now this one, notice with this one, it says partial genome. We don't want to use this because everything else has been full mitochondrial sequencing. So we don't want to use Prionomor, that particular one from Planiceps. And some of these other ones say partial genome. I need to clean up something in the paper I'm working on because I used the partial sequence. <laughs> uh, par partial sequences aren't bad if you're only using partial sequences for everything else. Well, just FYI, I'm analyzing the effect of frame shifts. I didn't need to actually use the whole sequence. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. We're just gonna, this is going to be a disaster if we frame shift this. Oh. But, but still, it would just look better if I used the whole genome. I mean, not the whole genome, the whole gene. So. Generally I'm, speaking, but I mean, okay. I, I'll gonna... get it that way. I'll lose. I'll get style points deducted. Okay. <laughs> You'll get style points deducted. <laughs> I mean, the, the only, the, the only, the big issue I think with, with, um, with using a partial gene, it's not necessarily a, a train wreck if you use a partial gene, if, if you're making a phylogeny and you're using a partial gene, the same partial gene from every organism. It's not as good as using a full genome because there might be a reason why that is conserved. Like cytochrome C, the sequence from cytochrome C is like, almost identical across most of life. 
which is why it tends to get used for phylogenies. Um, but the, it just it's just really highly conserved for that whatever reason. That that may have a func that may be a functional reason though. That may not be um, a ancestral reason. It may it may just be well, this is this is a functional reason. If, if you change it too much, it stops functioning essentially. Um, but it's a, kind of assumed that it, it, it equates with ancestry because you have the the, the changes in cytochrome C. Uh, no, why, why am I getting protein sequences? Oh, okay, I see what it's doing. I, I wasn't paying enough attention. I was talking too much and not paying attention. Um, all right, so I'll probably stop adding here, and we'll just run an alignment. Now, I, I will warn you, some of these alignments, the bigger the files you work with, the longer it's going to take to align stuff. Um and like when I'm I'm using, I'm going to actually stop here because we only got seven in here. Um, now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to align this. Now you get to you get to choose how you want to align it. You can either align by clustal or by muscle. You can pick. I generally use muscle. It, it does make a difference, but it's not that big of a difference. It does change a few things, but it's not it's not that big of a difference. So we'll click align, and it wants me to select two sequences. That's because I had this clicked. Right, if you see how Panthera Anka is highlighted compared to the others, that means that sequence is selected. Now I have to click off of that um, so that I actually can do an alignment. So if I um, generally I align by um, muscle without the codons, I don't do codons, um, but we can do you can do it however you want. So I will just click align by muscle, and it'll ask you if you want to select all. You do, and um, these things I don't generally change. And it'll start aligning. Now, I don't know how long this will take. And that's quite all right. We can talk through it yeah. while it's going. Um, I'm go what I'm going to do is uh, just uh, j just for the audience sake, what's happening is we're just walking through the tools that I'm going to use to argue against universal common ancestry of all proteins slash genes. That's not that's not the same thing as universal common ancestry of all organisms. What people have told me and our evolutionary opponents said, oh, it's perfectly fine to have um, independent origin of proteins, but it's all in one organism. I'm like, okay, um, uh, you, you don't quite see the disconnect there. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, and it's, it's actually gotten to the point. Independent origins just as a matter of principle but you really want to try to have it through one organism i said well, why stop there why don't you just have independent organism uh independent origin of organisms and then you'll be creationists just like us uh, they're getting there <laughs> they're getting so, there I, in, in my in my um organic evolution class in graduate school um the teacher made a statement that i almost fell out of my chair when i heard she said that um that there there is no universal common ancestor of eukaryotes yeah whoa okay that's <laughs> i'm really glad you're here and um maybe after you graduate you can tell us the full story but um whoa that's the first time i heard that i i was just hoping we could just blow away just the um, universal common ancestor of cells but now that they're saying no universal common ancestor eukaryotes at least oh. phylogenetically like there she's she she basically said that they're phylogenetically there are multiple most recent common ancestors <laughs> and you know what see the thing that i really want to get to it's not just lack of losing the phylogenetic signal they might say oh well you know all the organisms that we have today uh, we just can't reconstruct what the universal common ancestor was. Okay, so they could say they could just be the ignorance. And I'm like, okay, but are they saying that even in principle there wouldn't be a common ancestor? That's a much stronger statement. And and what I'm arguing is even in principle there could not be a universal common ancestor in the traditional sense in terms of organisms. So first, um, now that you showed the muscle tools, and, and we're, uh, I could also show some uh, things with BLAST. Do you use GenBank and BLAST or any, or Unipot? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, BLAST, 
Blast is really cool. I actually have a tutorial on my uh, on my website on how to use it with pictures because um, it was really, really cool. Um, when I discovered it, I was like, oh, the, I, I like massively nerded out. Like, oh, this is awesome. I can compare gene sequences. Um, that was even before graduate school. Um, but yeah, so. Have you worked with the Unipro? I interrupted you, Emery. Go ahead. So no, so no, that's fine. Go ahead. Go ahead and ask your question. Have you worked with the Unipro database? Unipro I do not think so. Okay. So this is kind of the running joke. They're the DNA genetics guys, and then they're the protein guys. I'm very much in the protein side. Mm -hmm. And there is a question, why do we will we do homogenies based on proteins versus the DNA that make the proteins? And uh, the proteins are easier for a number of reasons. I looked at a gene that had 35 exons on it. I'm just like, yeah, good luck trying to align genes of that across species. Yeah. That would be an interesting topic. It's like, is the, we could take the same, like say topoisomerase is a good example. And let's see the, um, the distribution of exons, if it's the same across species. That's an interesting question. That just occurred to me. Because topoisomerase has, two alpha has 35 exons in it. <laughs> That's just a huge number. I just like yeah, that Whoa. is that is a lot. And uh, I think it has some alternative splices. So this this is it's becoming kind of a nightmare protein to work with, just because um, it's it's already hard enough to work with just uh, one isoform. But when you have all the alternative splices, it's like man, this is going to be tough. Yeah, alternative splicing. Uh, um, I actually was told in my in my genetics class that I took in graduate school that um, that evolution that um, alternate splicing was one of the mechanisms of creating new genetic information. And I, I just sat there and and face palmed because no, it's it's not create all of. The, and I, I know that you aren't a huge fan of the information argument, Sal, but like I, I sat there and went. That, that that makes no logical sense because everything that alternate splicing works with is already there in the genome. It's not even a mutation. It's exactly. already there. You're just reading it different ways. Yes, that, that we call that algorithmic compression of information. And right. And, and and that's like I just looked at that and when people were telling me that this is this is, you know, you create new genetic information this way. And I I, I it was all I could do to not say something in the discussion board like this doesn't even fit logically. Let me just uh, while we're waiting for this sure. uh, to grind through, this is appropriate time to have a conversation like this. Having been an electrical, a student of electrical engineer, engineering, uh, information theory at some point, I mean, we had formal classes, uh, undergrad and graduate classes in information theory. It's called communication and information theory or digital communications. So, so even as an undergrad, I took at least one graduate level information class. And then in computer science, uh, even though I didn't have specific classes in this, we had the notion of algorithmic, algorithmic information. So where is this all headed? If I took a JPEG file or like say an MP3 file, just make it easy. Mm -hmm. MP3 file, and I asked an um, an electrical engineer how much is how much information is in that file, and and he would legitimately say, well, uh, from what perspective the Shannon information? If you have like say a uh, hundred kilobyte MP3 file, uh, you'd say, okay, it has a hundred three kilobytes of Shannon information. However. Uh, when it's decompressed, it's going to be many more bits than that. It's like, okay, do you want to talk about what it decompresses to? Um, because that file is algorith algorithmically uh, compressing the information. So then you'll get an another figure. And no one's going to agree on the exact number of that figure, what it decompresses to. And depending on what codec one uses, it's going to decompress the different sizes all from the same file. So all this to say, this 
this will muddle the information increase pro, uh, debate just because it's something in the eye of the beholder how much information is in a physical object how much information a physical object uh, can right. be contained and that's the problem with this alternate splicing thing is they could say oh it has this many shannon bits or or like when it alternatively alternatively splices you could say oh well now it's decompressing into a much larger uh form that's the actual number of bits and the arguments will never end because there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer it depends on the way you want to look at it it's so uh, i'm not saying the information argument is wrong in the i guess in the informal sense it's just not there's just not any way to prosecute it in a in a formal rigorous sense and that's why i focused on the hardware we can argue the actual basis of dna and say how improbable it is that it could have that structure but to to go right to the information argument um it's going to be problematic see now the way we res we the way we resolve these issues in the engineering world is yeah people that design the system you just ask them and they'll tell you so the, the reason it's easy to resolve these issues in the information world is we have access to the designers who are willing to tell us and say okay this algorithm compressed it to this many bits. You could actually talk to the recording engineer and say, okay, the original audio actually had this many of bits when it was sampled, um, you know, when, when it was sampled at 44 gigahertz, these were the actual bits. When it becomes compressed into an MP3 file, it loses some of the information. We call that lossy, uh, lossy compression. And then when it expands it, it, it incorporates some of that loss, but it's highly efficient. And they had some audio engineers that worked on the problem a long time to say, okay, we're going to give up some fidelity, but uh, let's just see how far we can push it where you won't notice the audio difference. Now, it's really funny. I had an um, audio CD, and then I had one that was lossy compressed to an MP3. I could tell the difference because I have kind of a sensitive ear for that. Mm -hmm. And the music did lose some warmth to it. Uh, it was, I'll never forget, it was Elvis Presley's Love Me Tender, Love Me Sweet. I, I don't know. The, the reason that it just sticks in my mind, I could actually tell the difference. It it, 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 it lost that glow when it, um, um, when I went from the C, the actual CD to the MP3 representation, it just lost something. So the moral of the story, is that's why I don't like using the information argument. It's not that it isn't um, fundamentally a bad argument. It's just not one that can be made rigorously. So yeah, like, when, yeah. Because it hinges very strongly on, on your definition of information. Yes. yes. And who defines that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you see, as someone that is wanting to have what they, uh, I call it, I think the term is sophistry. When they don't really have an argument, that, but they're just going to make as much noise and confuse the issues as, as much, it's kind of like a scorched earth policy. It's like none of us are going to win this debate. That's the way. And for them, a draw is a win because yeah. uh, they, they've totally messed up your ability to commu to, to succeed. And and uh, so once you throw the information argument on the table, you've, as a creationist, I feel I would have lost. Right. That's why when... Uh, that's why I feel that when we prosecute the hardware argument and talk in terms of uh, the forcefulness uh, of what chemistry says, people won't argue with that. There's, I mean, an atom is an atom. You're not going to have an argument over how the atoms are structured and the molecules. So anyway, yay, we got our... So we, we have an alignment now. Um, this, by the way, would take a lot longer if I was to do all of these. Um, <laughs> So that's why I didn't. Um, but notice something about the alignment here. I'm going to take it all the way back to the beginning. Notice there are bits and pieces where there are gaps, right, in the alignment. That's the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> it's basically just any place where there is things you couldn't align stuff, it, it left the gaps in, essentially. If there was a place where that couldn't be aligned, it did leave the gaps in. Now, this is where the fun starts, because now that you have an aligned DNA sequence, you can 
turn it into a phylogenetic tree. But in order to do this, you have to save it as a particular file type. Um, and so we want to export the alignment in mega format. I'm trying to remember if I hope I'm doing this correctly. Um, so the reason I know is I just did that in my show with Erica. Um, Evans for Sal. There we go. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Whatever. And then there's a. I think you can like minimize that window, and then it'll right. say. Yep. Uh, minimize that. Minimize that. I'm going to bring this up, and at this point, we're going to now create a phylogeny. And we now you get to pick what kind of phylogeny you want. There's five different options: maximum likelihood, neighbor joining, minimum evolution. You. Okay. You Dr. hates neighbor joining. He he what? He doesn't like neighbor joining. Oh, okay. Well, then we'll do so maybe just too annoying and pick neighbor joining. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, they're going to do neighbor joining just to get on his nerves. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, per per personally, I like max parsimony, but these I will like, give you slightly I different like results. The, I like the UPGMA just because it's cute. Okay. All right. no, no, one, no one, wait, no one I know personally uses UPGMA. Anyone who wants to publish, they don't use it. So maybe just to annoy people, I'll, I'll use it. <laughs> right, we'll use UPGMA. So we brought this thing up, um, and, and unfortunately, it's right. There we go. I'm going to have to do that there. Just do that. And we have just spit out a five tree. And this is what they call a nested hierarchy. Yes. I, this is an unrooted tree, correct? Yes, I didn't root this tree. No, I, I didn't do anything. Right. Tree. See, I want to get on Dr. Dan. I had a graph like that. He said, that's rooted. I said, no, that's unrooted. So, no, that 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 is that is an uh, definitely an unrooted tree. I did nothing to root the tree. In order to root the tree, I would have had to introduce an out group, and I didn't do that. So, well, well see, that's the thing is, how do you know what the right out group is? <laughs> I mean, there's good I, question. I'd like, like to, I've been well, asking evolutionists that for years. I have, don't have an answer. Well, that's the same thing I asked my. You know, uh, I've been asking around. I said, isn't that sort of circular? If yep. you try, you know, it's like, well, we we do it based on other. Uh, accepted trees, and it's like, I well, you know those trees are correct. So, so for the audience's benefit, let me walk through the circularity of picking an outgroup, because um, I think they'll I think they'll appreciate it. So in order to quote unquote root this tree, I would have had to pick something that is not a cat, um, probably something that's fairly closely related. I don't know. You pick something that's I don't know what all the, the animals. Dog. How about a dog? Yeah. Okay. We'll do a dog. That's probably not as closely related to some other stuff to quote to cats quote unquote. But we'll go with a dog. I would have had to stick a dog's DNA sequence in there. And then I would have had to select when I went to make my tree, I could then select and say, OK, such and such is, and I forget exactly where you do this, but um, there is a way to do it in Mega where you um, where you essentially say, OK, this is the out group. Um, Let me look and it will then root the tree on that out group. Um, and I can actually do it um, if I can remember where to do it from let's see where where is where do i add my out group here um i'll use a i'll use a recently oh i lost my uh it I, has I did been a while since oh there we go here we go root the tree on the out group okay here's the, option, here's the option for it i just saw it where'd it go so in the meantime i'm going to be setting up my my files to show you what i was doing Oh no! I had to pick the out group in advance. That's why. Okay. And you have to have their its sequence. So that's okay. Yeah. We don't have to do that now. Yeah. But yeah, no. You could. Re there is an option right here. You could say root the tree on out group. Um, I don't know if it allows me to select an out group here. Flip this. I can. I mean, I can do all kinds of tree. Oh, so I can root the tree on a branch on a pick on a particular branch. I can root it on an out group. I can do whatever I want with it. So. Um, <laughs> all kinds of fun you, stuff. You could actually take one of those sequences too and make that the root. I could, I could. Let me go back to the alignment. Uh, this would be right. kind of funny. You take the ones that are really close to each other and root it on that, which would oh, make we'll a just really drop it on the tiger, I think, and we'll see if we can make this the. See if I see if I can remember how to. Oh, and a nice little thing about this too. Sometimes in, um, I didn't look for this because I was trying to keep it simple. But sometimes in the uh, genome, the the uh, the sequence will be flipped. So it'll be basically in um, on the website. It will be flipped, so it'll be basically backwards. Oh, I wanted to tell you something. Sure, go ahead. Can you go back to your phylogenetic tree. Sure. Let me let me figure I, out it which. It relates to this whole thing about rooting human MTDNA. Uh, I got 
So I don't remember which where it is. There it is. Okay. Okay. So you see the the two on the kind of toward the bottom. What are they? Yes. I can't, uh, those the are prion allurus. Those are two members of prion allurus. All right. So this does relate to the empty DNA question of human. Mm -hmm. What they do with their rooting is they actually will take two very similar sequence and make that the root. And that's been the argument. Well, why would you make it? Why would you make that the root? Mm -hmm. um, you know, as kind of like the common ancestors, and then yep. everything. So, so, can you root on on one of those there that are close? Like, uh, let me see close? if I can remember how to do this. I may have to make a different tree because I don't think I ever really used this particular tree. I'm not the only. You're not, apparently I'm, you, your friends aren't the only one. I didn't use this particular one. Let me see. I'm, yeah. trying to I'm trying to remember how to do it because it's been a while since I've actually yeah, used I have, Omega. Um, oh, then I have a confession to make. I was so negative on this whole thing of rooting. I said I'm not even going to bother learning it. <laughs> um, honestly, I, I, I don't terribly blame you because rooting is a joke. Um, yeah, my feeling too. It's like, okay, everyone's going to root it differently. So as a matter of principle, most 99% of you are at least wrong. Mm -hmm. At least because you all can't be right. Right. So. Oh, okay. I see what I'm doing. I see what I need to do. Got it. Hang on. I need to select. So if I select, there we go. And now I can root. That's what I was doing wrong. Boom. Come on. I just I told you to root the tree on that. Did you do what I tell you? Oh uh, no, I don't want to draw a sub tree. Cancel. That's not what I want. I want this. Okay, and then where's the root button? Um, it still won't let me do it. Hmm. Oh, 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 you know what? We'll try this one. We'll try this one. Uh, it still won't let me do it. Maybe I'd have to s select the out group in advance. I don't remember. It's been so long since I've actually played. Oh, that's I'm a moron. Never mind. I don't know what I'm doing wrong, Sal, but I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've played with Mega. I know how to. I've, I've been able to root trees previously. It's just a matter of remembering how. And I may I may have done. Oh something. wait wait wait! I don't think you can do. Will it allow rooting in an UPGM GMA? Maybe it'll let you do it in the maximum parsimony. You, you know what? That might be why I was trying to figure out and discard those results. Yeah, UPGMA may not actually allow you to do it. So yeah. Yes, I do want to use that. That would be probably be why I, I was like I was trying to figure it out because I'm like I know how to root a tree I've done this before. Um, but, oh, come on. Root, boom, there we go. <laughs> yeah, it was it was UPGMA. Yeah. <laughs> no wonder nobody uses it. <laughs> well, 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 okay. See now it's bringing back some some uh, undoing cobwebs from when I was learning this. UPGMA will force it a certain way and rooting uh, it's not it's not going to be rooted so you now you could see the structure of the tree changes depending on what you think is the root and i said that's pretty that kind of sucks because then you could just you could just make the phyl phylogenetic tree have, have any structure you want yep. it doesn't mean right i mean yep. that would probably suggest that um it's in the eye of the beholder and i said that really bothers me Mm -hmm. I mean, doesn't that has a different shape now that you have a different root? Yep. And if I change the root, like if I switch that, so let me just pick this one instead and root it on that instead. Look at this. We've just completely changed the structure again. Yeah, yeah. And I know evolutionary biologists are going to be saying you're so stupid, you don't know what you're doing. I said, well, that may be true, but this is this would bother me. You wouldn't have stuff like this in physics. It would be yeah, this is this is this is pure arbitrary. Like you could. If you work at it hard enough, now, now I'm not saying the evolutionists do this, but if you work at it hard enough, you can make phylogenetic trees tell you whatever you want. You want. That's my whole point. And that was the whole argument in that mitochondrial DNA thing mm -hmm. where they said, oh, the root's here, you know, and it's like, well, how do you know that? It, you know, because that, that's all the things we have are archaeal. I, I just like, okay, all the circular reason goes. There's, there, there's, yeah. no, there's no objective way of determining a root it's yeah. inherently circular inherently circular and i i you know and th th they'll say oh we have other independent evidence i wanted to say oh really were you there you know 
I mean, the, I um, mean, at some point it does come down to the question of of what do you want to believe? Do you want to believe God made you, or do you want to believe that mindless processes of chance and undirected events made you? I mean, at some point it comes down to that. And then once you've made that choice, you can say, well, because I believe that, therefore this phylogeny must be true, even though phylogenetic, even though this is a kind of a weird thing about phylogenetics. If you read phylogenetic literature, the phylogeneticists themselves will say, yeah, um, we know phylogeny is actually true. It's just, may it's just a suggestion it's just a hypothesis we can't actually confirm it and this is all through the population the the phylogenetics literature i've read quite a bit of it, it they, they'll all say yep yeah we can't actually demonstrate this this is just kind of our hypothesis no, no, and, and again to be fair if we do an unrooted tree which is as objective as it get uh, you know we're not saying this is the how the you know we're not inferring the common ancestor and saying this is how the tree played out right all we're saying is there's relatedness and i'm, I'm fine with that saying yes there is a nested hierarchy of the extent of the existing organisms and i'm totally fine with that and i'll say i'm not going to not deny that but once they try to just start rooting the trees and say yeah we all descended from africans or whatever mm -hmm. um yeah it, yeah it, i'm like, fine yeah, with like you could arguing arguing that certain animals are more similar to each other than others. Okay, fine. What does that prove? It doesn't prove ancestry. It just proves that we can look at two animals and go, wow, they look similar. Now, sometimes it might be indicative of ancestry, like um, a, a leopard and a, um, a leopard and a jaguar look kind of similar. Well, you know what Walter Remind said is the ultimate test? Go ahead. He said, if they interbreed, mm -hmm. then they're the same created kind. He said, there's no argument there. Right. So we have to count. So if you have a lion and a um, leopard and they breed together, uh, we call them lepons. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm I'm perfectly fine with saying, yeah, th they descended from a common ancestor. That's going to be pretty hard to. I mean, even a lot of creationists would not deny it at that point. And I'm perfectly fine with that. And so these phylogenetic trees of animals that are able to hybridize, uh, it, it may show something of their, um, one might be able to possibly reconstruct what the common ancestor might have looked like. But then uh, this is where I went ahead with this. Even that, I'm just like, well, what are you achieving? I, I mean, uh, uh, that's why I went to other arguments like the eukaryotes and the proteins you know, mm -hmm. very basal. So that's, I'm just pointing that out that um, um, uh, there's a, there's a group of people that are just almost pure baromenologists and they're like, uh, they're not, some of them don't actually get along well with the anti-creationist. I'd be, I mean, anti-evolutionists. So there are two people in the creationist camp, the anti-evolutionists and then the baromenologists. And, um, uh, we almost speak different languages, but this is what you're pointing out is one thing that I'm just like, I, you know, even though I agree that either something's the same kind or the not, not, I don't know what to do with the file, uh, rooting the phylogeny. And we see that with the mitochondrial leave. Mm -hmm. uh, to my knowledge, neither Robert Carter nor Nathaniel Jensen are going to argue what the, where the proper root exactly is they, they'll say it's probably here but i don't know so right, right from what i've heard from jeanson and carter basically they say yeah we, we think this is about where she is but you know if we're not right if we're off by a little bit well you know is what it is because phy phylogenetics is is rather inexact take the back it's very inexact and it's very much it's very much it's, it's it, in certain aspects it is inherently circular now and it is very much also garbage in garbage out um for those of you who are computer people you you'll get that what you put it, it just takes what you've put in and kind of spits it back out at you in a in a graphical form um so it's only as good as the data you give it so, so um i'm glad you showed the mega and if you had some other words i'm going to bring up I have a very simple argument against protein common ancestry 
And one reason I don't have to cover it much, my shock, speed of sound, immutable destiny. Uh, when I put that on the table, even emo, they said, oh, yeah, that's so obvious. They don't have a common ancestor. Are you dumb? And I'm just like, well, thank you. <laughs> I mean, it's like, oh, gee, why don't I see it? You know, I wanted to challenge them. And I said, why don't? Why isn't this pointed out in textbooks? I said, name, name me one biology textbook that will say that explicitly. And you know why it's not there, because you know the creationists are going to seize upon that. Mm -hmm. they, they, I'm like, are you saying now that there's an orchard model for proteins, the major protein families? Because you know that sounds very much like baromenology. And and they they had a whole two hour show and Sal, uh, Speed of Sound called it uh, Sal needs a brain and they misrepresented what I said. I didn't say that I believe they they all had a universal common ancestor. Uh, and I didn't say that I believe anyone believes that they all had a universal common ancestor. I was just pointing out no one's hardly talking about it until I brought it on the table. But it was just really funny. They had a whole two-hour show uh, just kind of strawmanning what I said. But they were all saying, yeah, look, there's, you know, you have to be stupid if you think all proteins and gene, uh, slash genes descended from a common ancestral gene. I'm just like, well, no. Um, I never believed that, but I'm really glad you're spending a two-hour show <laughs> arguing for independent origins and a uh, what, what is basically a orchard model. I'm just like you, you we're, we're turning you into baromenologists. Yeah, as as Rob Carter is fond of saying, um, the evolutionary model is becoming more biblical, and I'll add to that: it's becoming more biblical at warp speed. Yeah. So, so, okay, so we have our, inter and, and I told Erica that, and she was a little bit shocked. And I'm like, uh, I'll give you the citations. Rather than me discuss it with you, why don't you talk over it with Speed of Sound and Immutable Destiny? Uh, so let me see. Uh, let me bring this up, protein probabilities. So if you had something more to say, because I'm, I'm digging up my. No, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, so, so you could uh, fill out the time while I dig up my. Oh no, that's fine. I, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing screen here, um, so I can close Mega. Um, but yeah, you know, phy phylogenetics is something that's a lot of fun to play with, um, and you can learn some stuff from it. But you do have to realize that it's got significant issues. So it just probably best not to be too too reliant on it. So, yeah. So let me see if I have. Um, it's it's been a while since. Uh, it's been a while since I I have a previous slideshow. Okay, all right. This is the, about the right. This is as close to the uh, correct slideshow that I wanted to show, and I'm gonna let me. This is a very easy, okay, I'm not going to belabor this, partly mm -hmm. because one of the rare times my internet opponents on the evolution side are not going to disagree with me. And so I'm going to show uh, some slides here. And I'm not going to belabor it, but I'm just like, uh, as Dr. Carter said, it's becoming more creation sounding all the mm -hmm. time. So now that's a shock to me that your professor would admit independent origins of independent, there's no universal eukaryotic ancestor, but I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. So we just had these, uh, we saw the DNA sequences in the world that I tend to work in is in the proteins. So I'm going to show a protein sequence. Let, let me uh, back this up a little bit. Let me see. Okay. okay let, let me, uh, I'm sorry, apologies to the That's audience. Uh, I'm going to yes. bring up also yet another slide. So I'm going to bring up a yet another slideshow. Believe me, Sal, we all want to learn from you. So, oh, thank you. It's a very kind thing to say. Uh, 
and you'll you you I I can almost this is such an easy argument to make when one has really good visuals. Mm -hmm. So let me just start with the collagen molecule. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, screen share. There we go. And I'll highlight it. I'll turn it on. Highlight it. Collagen, 20 to 30 percent by weight of the human body is made of collagen. If we talk about protein mass, that's an enormous amount. And it's coded by only about 30 genes. So there are many, many copies of the collagen. Of, 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 there are about 30 collagen paralogs. I mean, the number can shift because everyone has a slightly different definition of what a collagen, what will qualify as a collagen. Right. And I'm going to show the sequence. So each of the molecules can fit, it has certain biophysical properties, but this is the collagen, this is the collagen sequence for collagen alpha one, the alpha paralog, type one, alpha one paralog. Yep. And so they, uh, collagen's naturally occurring and they sell it, they sell collagen beauty products at Walgreens. This is yep. not an endorsement of it as a beauty product. But I'm just saying it is it is a real protein. And there's a striking pattern here. Uh, and I'm going to highlight that in red. So you could see the glycines repeat every three. It's just it's rare we'll ever get a protein where it's just that blatant that it has a non-random pattern. Uh, some people have tried to argue, oh, well, yeah, you know, there's homo all sorts of tandem repeat mechanisms. And I'm like, no, not this one. Uh, because it has slightly different amino acids in between the Gs, that's not a very good explanation. So, but that's neither here nor there. This is a very striking pattern. And so let me, let me ditch this particular presentation, and I'm going to go to another slide. Let's see if I can close it. Yeah, I think this is the other presentation. I'll show you another protein. Zinc fingers. Zinc finger is another protein. And I'm going to show you a striking pattern there. You see it? Yeah. Now, that doesn't look like a collagen. So where this is headed, just to get to the chase, if I threw this in a computer, or a muscle alignment, and then to try to build a phylogenetic tree, it might kind of croak. I mean, the computer will like say, what are you trying to do? You know? Computer would die. Yeah, it's like, and if, so if we take all the known proteins and put them and try to run it through a hidden Markov model, it's going to find no universal common ancestor. So uh, as you were showing, let's see if I could see if it's even here. Okay, so what we can do is, for a zinc finger, we could take a human zinc finger protein and then the corresponding one in the pig. And they're not spelled exactly the same. And we can build phylogenetic trees uh, of the human and other creatures and throw them in. You, you will get a tree. You, you will get a tree. And that would suggest common ancestry um, along the lines of the zinc finger. And so let's just take that as um, for the sake of argument. And I'll talk about the geocentrism in a little bit. And we could do the same with collagen. We could take human collagen and zebrafish collagen. Uh, both the human and the zebrafish have that same repeating G pattern. It's striking. It's, you know, and I can understand why they'll say, well, that obviously is common ancestry. And let's just let's just say, assume for the sake of argument, all the organisms do have a common ancestor. So that's not the argument. I'm not arguing at this point against um, a universal common ancestor of organisms. Okay, so that's just a given. But I can almost guarantee, and not just again with conversations, 
you might one might be able to make phylogenetic trees on the collagen and then phylogenetic trees on the zinc fingers like that but when you take both proteins you can't make a common ancestor between the two and you could see also just visually why that's just ridiculous to even think that it's it would be very forced i mean right. you can try to imagine it but it just doesn't flow naturally so the phylogenetic trees that flow naturally when you're doing this in the same kind that's okay but it totally falls apart here when you try to unify you know one common ancestor of all of them because they all have distinct architectures there's no transitional between this and that it's just ridiculous to think that i, I mean for one this is what like over a thousand residues this is only 500 and uh, yeah so just like then the architectures, you have different architectures of pianos, but it's still the piano architecture. And then you have different architectures of cars, but it's still the basic car architecture. And then same for blenders. So we could say homologs obey the same architecture, but they're basically the same conceptual kind. And, and cars are the same conceptual kind. And blenders are the same, you know, blenders within a... Um, blender group are the same conceptual kind, but it, it doesn't mean because you can group them like this, that they all descend from one common ancestor. Uh, it's just not going to work. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was right. pretty easy. And, and like I said, uh, it was really kind of funny. Uh, they were spending two hours uh, arguing for independent, com independent ancestry of protein groups but they had to make me try to make me look stupid, you know, so they didn't represent my position accurately. But I'm like, okay, I'll take that, you know, at least you're agreeing with my conclusion, even if, you know, it's like you have to save face and say that I didn't know what I was talking about or just totally misrepresent what I said, but I got what I needed. So yeah. I'm not going to have to belabor this because they agree with me. So this kind of gives the idea of like, okay, yeah, all the proteins are kind of a kind in, of themselves. Whether there's universal common ancestry for organisms, that's another topic. But I felt this already moved things in the right direction. Yeah, it's a step in the right direction. So with that, I think we've gone on for an hour. And since yes, we this have. is a technical discussion, I don't want to wear out our audience. Uh, yeah. I think an hour, 15-minute lecture is good. Then we can talk about eukaryotic evolution maybe next time yeah that, that's perfectly fine i'm happy to happy to chat whenever uh you know whenever you uh whenever i can and whenever you uh, feel like it and uh you know, I, i've done some writing on some of the problems with phylogenetics um on my on my blog so if you want to check out some of those feel free um and, uh, yeah yeah well you see that's that's the thing is i couldn't have made this argument 30 or 40 years ago we didn't have the sequences or maybe let's just just to be safe we wouldn't have been able to make this argument 100 years ago. But now it's yeah. become very, very clear that um, independent independent origins of proteins, and they're saying it's so obvious. And I'm like, don't you get the problem? I mean, it would mean that uh, for some of the really important proteins, they had to be there simultaneously. You're not going to be able to get around that. Uh, and that would require miracles in in my book. Yep, yeah, well, it would. Um, and just and and remember, they folks for those watching. I know Sal knows this. They don't just need to get two proteins. <laughs> how, how many proteins e exist, Sal? I mean, it's what thousands, thousands, thousands. Yeah. And and the minimum number that they've been able to get in one parasite. Okay, so uh, you can't just say a parasite is able to do this. That's the minimal cell because it needs certain nutrients that only other bacteria or other creatures can make. So this, this right. brings up a whole bunch of issues of what's the minimal living organism, because um, uh, and we don't need to go there. Even with that, even that one, the microplasm genitalia of, genitalium of uh, Craig Ventner's. Right. He, was yeah. driving, he created life, which he didn't. That was just hype. Um, <laughs> uh, it, even that had 400 and I wanted to look through that list. I did try the supplement and materials don't seem to be accessible on the net anymore. Uh, they were, I don't think there was any nefarious, but you know how 
Right. Yeah. Stuff moves around, gets taken down, and yeah, yeah. I I, I don't think it was nefarious that anything got taken down. Uh, hopefully they'll they'll make it available again, and we could actually look at what the major protein classes are that were represented in that. And it wouldn't surprise me that we could actually make the argument of that many of them would fall into these groups that could possibly could not possibly have a universal common ancestor. And I'll say, okay, yep, this means independent creation at the same time because the thing would be dead. Of course, they'll appeal and say, well, no one's saying that the way life looks now is the way it was back then. And I'm just like, okay, so you're going to appeal to something you can't describe, you can't at, possibly reconstruct, you can't possibly test, you can't possibly know. Uh, so, and then and you're asking me to have faith in that, that you can't even describe it. Like, do you know how silly you guys look when you're complaining that we can't describe all the details of God and how he did it? You can't do the same for even your own theory, but you, you subscribe to it and you're pretending that you've actually proven it and you haven't. You For your theory to hold up, you have to appeal to unseen entities and processes you'll never be able to describe. So, Yep. And that, and honestly, a lot of evolutionary biology, a lot of evolution, is just that. Just that. Yep. But they, the difference is they don't want to admit. They don't want to admit they're appealing to unknown, unprovable, untestable, and actually infeasible mechanisms. They, they just won't. They won't admit that they need miracles to make their theory work. And that's the point that I'm trying to, to, to finally make. We're going to point out that balance they're they're just as faith-based if not more than creationists because where they fail is they'll say okay do you accept physics and chemistry and they'll say yes i said there's a problem here because what you're describing won't agree with everything we know about the way physics and chemistry work yep that's the difference at least creationists will say there had to be a suspension of what we know of physics and chemistry. It's a different mechanism. We may never describe it. That's the difference. And at least I think our claim is more consistent yeah. with the data. Because, it, you know, to say it's cons if they say that the origin of life and then the origin of eukaryotes is consistent with phys physics and chemistry, this is like talking about square circles and Euclidean geometry. It's a contradiction. <laughs> So. Yes, exactly. Um, and, and just as just as a point out point to the audience, um, for for a Christian, bo both the cre creationists and the evolutionists must believe that at some point the laws of physics, chemistry, and biology um, were uh, either didn't exist and that thus could not be thus were ignored, or existed and were violated. The yeah. evolutionist believes they existed and were violated. The creationist <laughs> believes. God's God basically said, "Okay, I'm making stuff, and I'm making the laws as I make the stuff." Yeah. Now, which one's more reasonable? Exactly, exactly. And so, what I get on them and say, they'll say, "Well, you can't prove it," and I'll say, "Well, the problem is, I'll admit that the problem is you guys aren't very, aren't very forthright in saying you can't prove your theory either. You have to keep advertising it as established fact." And, and that's not, that's being misleading. Uh, that's being deceptive. It's not being forthright and honest. You're telling half truth. And I, I have real problems with that. And um, so, uh, you know, my hope is our channel actually just comb through the data. And if they want to challenge me, that's great. If I'm wrong, I'll correct myself. But as far as this independent origin of proteins, I don't, I haven't had anyone disagree with me on that no one has challenged me and it's it's reassuring because when creationists say something if if they don't agree with it you'll you'll, you'll get an earful you'll have videos made about you and, it, and you know i'm really glad that they have well i don't know how to say this but they have all these videos about kent hoven they don't have very many videos about the content i put out <laughs> i mean on technical terms yeah i mean right. kent hoven is more popular but, uh, you know, on technical terms, they're not challenging what I'm saying. And that's what I'm hoping to achieve. You and I, uh, while you're on semester break, we'll at least cover some of these things and see what they have to say. And if if we're wrong on a technical point or if our choice of words was, mis, you know, can be easily misconstrued, 
I want to thank the critics for giving us free of charge peer review. So exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to prosecute this. We're going to do it right. And, mm -hmm. um, by God's grace, by God's grace. Amen. God's willing. So that's, that's all I have. Maybe in the next segment, we'll talk about eukaryotic evolution, but at least today we showed that we do know how to create trees, that there are problems with phylogenetic methods because of this thing of rooting. We totally agree you can build nested hierarchies. There's clear, <clears throat> clear as day evidence that um, one creature is more similar than another. So I'm more similar to a chimp than I am to a tree. There's no question that we can arrange organisms in some sort of general uh, set of conceptual families where the creatures are more similar to each other than uh, other creatures. And, and that's not... That's not, I have no problem with that. I do have a problem actually with creation saying that nested hierarchy doesn't exist. What Emery did today, uh, he showed it with the mitochondrial DNA. It's very easy to show um, closeness of relatedness. And he just used these unrooted trees. It's blatantly obvious. And I see it, I try to tell creationists, I see it in my everyday work when I do gene, when I do uh, protein browsing. So, um, Anyway, Emery, I'll give you the last word, and um, I'd like to thank our audience for their time. I know this is a really nerdy topic, but going into these details, strengthen our case. Um, plain, boring facts. I've tried to say, you know, people want exciting theater arguments, and where the advance is made is with plain, boring facts, because mm -hmm. facts carry the day. So, Emery, I'll give you the last word. All right, thank you. Um, uh, first of all, thank you to the audience for, for their patience listening to two nerds ramble on about phylogenetics for close for over an hour. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, thank you very much for showing up. Um, if you uh, want to check out more on this stuff, I know Sal's got tons of great content on his, uh, on his uh, YouTube channel that he's putting up. Um, there's all kinds of good stuff there. Uh, more nerdy stuff like this. Um, I've got some of my own nerdy stuff. My, my stuff tends to be a little less nerdy than Sal's, um, although it has been trending in the nerdier direction as I got more and more educated. It tend, it's been trending in the nerdy di nerdier direction. Um, so, uh, but you can check out my blog. It's in inhisimage.blog. You can check out my YouTube channel, in his image. Um, I'm on a bunch of different social medias too. Some stuff goes out every day, so except Sunday. So um, feel free to check that out. Um, and, and yeah, just, just remember guys, like, look, when somebody, when an evolutionist comes at you with, with something that says, you know, well, we, we evolved from, from pond scum to people over millions of years, take some time, actually research what they're saying. A lot of times what you'll find is, yeah, there may be, there may be some stuff that they're telling you that's true, but a lot of it is also stretched or not represented correctly or is based completely on inference. So yeah, that's all I got. Thank you, Sal, for having me. Yes, I, I hope maybe sometime later this week we'll get together again. But uh, in any case, Merry Christmas to you, Emery. Merry and Christmas to our audience. So take care. Have a good night. I'll, I'll meet you backstage for just a, a few. Right. God bless everyone.